Welcome back to the Growth Engineers podcast. What do you really know about the clients you market and sell to? Like, what do you really know? Do you really understand who they are, how they think, how they buy? Well, if you don't, it's time to work on your ICP, Ideal Client Profile. So tune into today's episode where we talk about how you create it, what it's all about, and how it can help you attract and keep more of your ideal clients. Stay tuned. All right, Atiba, welcome to this episode. I'm excited about this one. Whoa, My friend, talk about What's up, buddy? ICP, 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 all day long. We refer uh, to it in future episodes and past episodes. And we're going to spend some time today. And I'm going to draw out of your big brain, my friend, everything you know about ICP, because it is so Ooh. important to really define and understand and leverage this information, right? Yeah. So why don't we even start? Tell us about it. Just get us going today. Yeah. So first and foremost, let's start here and let's talk about why it's important to you. Okay. And it's important to you because whether you recognize it or not, the thing that you want is more traffic. If you're running paid ads, if you're doing organic marketing, you want more eyeballs on your stuff. Everybody does. I don't know anybody who doesn't. You want more eyeballs, right? And People end up saying, hey, you know, I got to optimize my ads or maybe my SEO isn't right or what, 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 what. And they miss something that's super, super important. There's a lot of technical stuff that you can fix mm -hmm. with your content, with your ads, et cetera, et cetera. But there's one thing that if you don't fix this, none of the rest of it matters. And that is growing an obsession with your ideal customer. Yeah, I said it, an obsession. That's what it is. <laughs> it has to become an obsession. You have to get to the place where you know your ideal customer better than they know themselves, where you can predict how they're going to react to things better than they can predict it. Because when you do that, then all of the stuff you do to generate traffic will work so much better, okay? It will work so much better because you'll be speaking directly to them. Because here's the deal. Here's the deal. If I came on here right now and started talking in super flowery language, like you were in the third grade, you would <laughs> stop listening to me because you're not in the third grade. You're a business owner, you're a mover, you're a shaker. You want to get stuff done. You need to get to the point. You need to learn something, implement it, move on, have success. You see? And so understanding how to communicate with your ideal customer is going to put them in a place where they want to do business with you because they would have learned to know you, like you, and trust you, and then open their wallet for you. That's why this is so important. That's why it's so key and so crucial and why it needs to be your focus. You sold me, man. You've sold me. And I know you've probably sold our audience too. We understand. So now we understand the importance, right? Yeah. So what goes into a profile? Right. I mean, yeah. do I care about how much they earn or their shoe size or if they have two dogs or what goes into a profile? Yeah. So the truth of the matter is there's nothing about them that should not go into a profile. Let me put that in more simple terms. Everything's important. Mm -hmm. Why is everything important? You're going to say, you know, I sell tractor trailers. Okay, you sell tractor trailers, no problem. And you're going to wonder why the fact that they are watching Married at First Sight with their spouse is important. <laughs> well, here's why it's important. Because let's say there was a reference to something in Married at First Sight that you can connect to what you do. You're communicating at a level that they understand. You're communicating at a level that they understand. So there is nothing that isn't important. But now, that being said, 
we want to look at their demographics and their psychographics. Now, in the demographics, and this is where most people stop, because this is what we were taught in school. If you went to school for business, if you went to school for marketing, this is what you were taught. Where do they live? What do they do? How much money do they earn? How many kids do they have? Are they married? What kind of car they drive? Right? Those are fixed data points that are measurable. Let me ask you a question. Why are they driving a 2015 Toyota Camry? Why? Understanding the answer to that question might help you sell to them better. Maybe it is that they love stuff that has longevity. They don't want to buy something today and buy it again in two years. So when you present your product, you need to present your product from the perspective of the longevity of it. That's why knowing that they have a 2015 Camry in 2023 and beyond makes sense. But maybe it's not that. Maybe they're just cheap. <laughs> they don't want to buy a new car. That's where you have to become obsessed. And that's where you start to getting into the psychographics. Because the psychographics now says, why is it that they do what they do? What causes them to move and what causes them to stand still? What are those things? What are those markers? Okay. Because once we start to understand those, then we can really understand how to help them accomplish their goals. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say here is not just understanding how they think, but what drives a behavior. Yes. Because we want to influence our market's behavior. That's the whole point yeah. of marketing, right? Is to cause yeah. them to do something. Yes. So that why is so important. Absolutely. You know, the Camry example is a good one because the, the other why in my mind was maybe they're just resistant to change. Maybe. Right? If you know that, does that change how you present? Does it change how you message this transition you're trying to sell them? Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Banks are really good at this. Banks are really good because, you know, if I said to you, Atiba, you've got to change all of your accounts because you're moving your bank. That's no fun. All the direct deposits and the debit card and the credit card, it's a pain in the butt. So banks are really good at marketing. We will help you facilitate that change, make that change really easy. That's the yeah. number one. One of the big objections bankers get is it's too much of a pain in the ass to move. CPAs, same thing. Attorneys, same thing. So if you know that resistance to change is the objection, you can overcome it before it becomes a problem. So I love that. That's yeah. awesome, man. And that's a really big thing there because we don't know what it is, right? Because back to the Camry example, maybe they've got bad credit. And so they can't get another car. And so now your $30,000 program, guess what? Don't tell them to get a loan in order to get it because they got bad credit. But you don't know that, right? And so one of the really important pieces of the ideal customer profile that so many of us miss, and let me be honest, be completely honest, I miss it sometimes too. Right. I talked to my coach yesterday about something new that we were doing. And she said, you've not spent enough time talking to your customers. You've not spent enough time asking them questions. And that's the big mistake so many of us make is we do have some customers or we have some people that we think maybe are ideal customers in the wild that we can reach. And we are afraid to ask them questions. But you have to get over that. It's the only way you'll get to know them and really hear and understand what's really going on. You yeah. have to be willing yeah. to ask. You yeah. cannot build an ideal customer profile without actually having voice of customer research. And it has to be the voice of the customer in your research. What a concept, right? What a concept. Go to the source. So that really leads me to my next question. And you've already started to sort of go down this road. Help our audience understand 
So how can they go about defining this ideal customer profile? We know we've got to talk to some people, talk to some humans, yeah. but walk yeah. us through the process. Yeah. And so it really depends on where you are in your business. Okay. So let's say you're just starting out. And if you're just starting out or you're in business already, but you're bringing a new product or service to market and you're going after a new customer, you're just starting out too. Okay. So anytime you're targeting somebody new, you're just starting out, right? If you're in that boat, yes, yes, yes. You have to make assumptions. You're going to make some assumptions up front. You're going to say, okay, I believe these are their demographics. I believe these are the things that they're doing. Now, you can do some market research to help with those assumptions, okay, until you get to the place where you actually have some real people to go get voice of customer research from. So in creating an ideal customer profile, it always starts off with you in your head of thinking about, okay, who are they? And let me write down what I think I know about them. After you write down what you think you know about them, then you have to go validate that. You don't get to stop there and say, this is what I think, so therefore it's true. You don't get to stop there. You have to go validate it, and that's what I was saying just now about asking questions. You've got to go ask them about this, okay? So real talk once again, because y'all know we give real talk here. We tell you what's going on, right? So we've got a new tool that's coming out. And as I was talking to my coach last night about it, and I was telling her about it, and she said, you know, I think your problem is you think you're going to market this to the wrong customer. The customer that you think you want to market this to can't actually use this tool. And I said, but of course they can. Because, and I said, but I tried, and this person, and this person, and this person. And she said, yeah. But the commonality between all those people you just listed is they have nothing in common with the person you're trying to market to. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. And I had to hear that because I'd made some assumptions. I had gone out and tested, but I, I had to realize I tested on the wrong people. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you'll be there too. It's an iterative process. And that's one of the things I want to tell you. Creating an ideal customer profile is like creating a human being that's going to grow and change over time. What you know about your ideal customer today, I guarantee you three months from now, you'll know more. And so it continues to grow. It's like a relationship. It's like a marriage. Like you know your spouse better today than you did when you first married them. It's going to grow and evolve. Yeah. Yeah. That's words of wisdom. And if you've been in business for any length of time, three yeah. months, three years, three decades, I don't care. The reality is the clients you're working with today probably don't fully align with the ideal client you need in the future. You've That's probably awesome, outgrown right? your clients. Your product has changed. The market yeah. has shifted. And I go through a similar process you described. And one of the things I do to, with clients is I don't want them to describe their current client. I don't care about their current client. If you could start with a completely fresh slate, knowing what you know today, describe this future ideal client. Then we do the validation. And then once yeah. we've got this profile written, we align it or we lay it next to the profile of our existing clients. And very rarely does do it align. They yes. don't. Most of the time, yeah. they don't. They so don't. Never, never rely on current assumptions. I'll put it that way. All right. So that's gold, gold to you. Yeah. All right. So yeah. we're going through the process. We're validating with the market. We're talking to humans. We're getting feedback. We're starting to find some commonalities, right? That's a big mm -hmm. piece of the process. We're starting to understand mm -hmm. how they think and all of those things. That's all part of this really important process. Yes. What do we do with it? How is that going to help us help them with our products yeah. and services? That we offer? Right, because then it just becomes this piece of paper, right? Or like what we used to do, when we used to do this a lot, we used to take it and we would take it over to Kinko's back in the day or FedEx office and get it printed and put a picture of a real person on it and they would hang it in their wall and it would be this beautiful thing hanging on the wall, right? And guess what? Wall art doesn't sell anything unless it's wall art <laughs> that you were selling <laughs> right yeah. and so yeah so what do we do with it and so i want you to understand where we're going and that's the question that dean is asking here where are we going and here's where we're going right 
And some of you who are going to hear me say this right now, you're going to be repelled by what I'm about to say, but I want you to listen to me. And some of you are going to completely understand, okay? Humans move because they're in pain. Humans do not move because of love. Yes, I'm sure. You say, but we get married because of love. No, you get married. Yes, you do love this person, but you get married because you're tired of being alone or whatever else was going on. And you found this person who fixes that problem. Yep. Okay? Pain is what causes us to move. How do you know? When you first fall in love, what do you do? You talk to the person all the time and you never move. You get together and you sit on the couch and you watch movies all day and you don't move. Yeah. Love causes you to stay still. Pain causes you to move. When they piss you off, what do you do? You get up and you move away from them. Okay? How does that relate to our ideal customer profile? You see, because as we're going through and we've done these demographics and we've done these psychographics, now what we're starting to look at, and we've looked broad, now we're going to narrow down and start to say, okay, now as it relates to what we do and how we can help them in their lives, what are the pain points that they have? What are the, the pain places that are going to cause them to move? What are the things that they are trying to overcome, to get better at, to grow through, that's causing pain in their life right now. You see, because it's the identification of those things, those pain points that then fuels your content. And your content then says to them, hey, you've got this pain point. We've got this solution that solves your pain point that then causes them to take action. Yeah. So messaging, this is a pro tip around messaging that Atiba just said. So for our audience, let me break it down a little bit for you. If you try and attract people into your messaging ecosystem, your world, so you can nurture and build credibility, you won't attract them. You won't attract them with future love. You'll right. attract them with current pain in a language that they use, not in our technical, professional environment. Use the language they use that yeah. speaks to the pain that they're experiencing today. They will say, holy yeah. shit, he's talking to me. Yes. That will attract them. And then you can move them from current pain to future pleasure. All good. Yes. Attract them with the current pain in their world that they're experiencing. You'll relate to them immediately. They will build trust and credibility immediately. And they'll do what a yeah. team is doing. They'll nod their head and say yes. Yes, all day long. All day long. All day long. And then you'll know in that moment, because I've got this pain or they've got this pain point. I'm creating this content. They also watch Game of Thrones. I can make a Game of Thrones reference in my content. That's going to help them feel even more aligned with me. And I'm dealing with their current pain and getting them to future pleasure. They're realizing, oh my gosh, you're my best friend. Or more succinctly, here's what they'll say to you. Here's what they'll say to you. I've never felt like someone was more in my head. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to feel like you know their thoughts. And it's not a creepy thing. That's what they want. That's exactly what they want. Absolutely. This whole trust, credibility, thought leadership, all of these words that we use, these phrases that we use, what is the goal of all of those? It's what you just described, that connection with that yeah. person. Not with a market, yeah. not with an industry, not with a generic Bob the buyer profile. It's with the person. Person, yes. Then all of the yeah. other competition, noise, and everything falls to the wayside. So that's so, so, so important. All yeah. right. Next question for you, man. Yeah. How Let's do we go. use this information to craft our offer to solve a problem or a challenge our ideal customer is facing? Yeah. So once you have that picture of your ideal customer profile, right? There's a book by Alex Hormozy, 
$100 million offers. Love the book. Okay. And why I love the book is because Alex starts off in the book and he says, listen, it takes the same effort to create a crappy offer as it does a $100 million offer. <laughs> Your choice. <laughs> Which way you want to go. Right. And so obviously you want to go to the $100 million offer way. But then as you go that way and you start to listen to Alex, you'll hear what he's saying. He's saying, you're going to be able to bucket their pain points into one out of four buckets. And as you bucket their pain points into one out of these four buckets, you'll then be able to start to say, how does my offer solve their problem? And for some of those things, you will say, okay, my offer solves their problem in this way. And then you may even realize, which happens a lot, my offer actually doesn't solve this part of their problem at all. But in order for them to buy, they're going to need that problem solved. And so now you get to make that choice. Okay, so how do I fix that? Is there an easy way that I can fix that inside of my offer of something else I can add on that helps solve that problem that they're having? Or is this an opportunity where I need to say, hey, Dean, you solve this part of the problem. Can we partner? And when I get a client, can I use this piece of your thing to help solve their problem too? Right? And you get collaboration that way. The point though is... Okay, here's the point. The point, though, is when you've done an ideal customer profile and you understand all of their pain points and then you look at creating and crafting offer and you bucket those offers, I mean, those pain points into the different buckets, and then you go through the exercise of figuring out what it would take to solve that pain point for them in all the different ways that they could possibly be looking at it based on their ideal customer profile. Once you've done all of that, and you then are sitting in front of Mr. or Mrs. Prospect and you present your offer when you present it and every single thing that they could have think of, every single thing that they could be going through has already been checked. What in the world can they say other than yes? Yeah. That's the power of it. It feels like mind reading, but like you yeah. said, not in a creepy way. Yeah. That's awesome. So we covered a lot today. A lot of stuff on ICP, lots more to come. For our listeners, this is the foundation It is of building not just your marketing, but building your business. Engineering the growth in your business has to start with knowing your ideal customer. Yeah. It has it does. to. That's where it all comes from. What's the big takeaway here? What would you say is the one thing our listeners can do today to move down this process, start this process? So I'm going to answer that in a way that most people aren't going to expect, okay? You and I, and like most other people, got into business because we were good at something. Whatever it is that we sell, we were good at doing it, making it, providing it, better than other people around, okay? For whatever, however we got there, whether we had a pain point, we went to school for, however we got there, we were good and that's what got us into business for the most part, right? And what you and I have done is we've spent a ton of time. This is what my coach was telling me last night. You spent a ton of time creating this product and thinking about this product that you're gonna to bring to market. And what I wanna challenge you with is, how much ever time that you've spent in creating the, your product and your offer that you're bringing to market, you need to spend at least five times that on defining and understanding your customer. And I want you to sit with that for a moment. I want you to sit with that for a moment. I'm sitting with it right now. Okay. My coach made me sit with it last night. I'm just paying it forward. I want you to sit with it for a moment and realize that you've not spent enough time obsessing over your customer. And that is the one thing that's keeping you from the success that you desire. I guarantee you that. Wonderful. Great. Powerful words, man. Powerful words. Well, thanks everyone for joining us this week on the Growth Engineers. Bookmark this episode. Because I know I can read the future. 
And I know in future episodes, we're going to refer back to this episode. This so bookmark it, write, keep your notes handy. You're going to need it in the future. So thanks for joining us this week, Atiba. Great talking with you as always, my friend. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, buddy. Good to see you. See you next week. Bye, everybody.